refine it to your a, a range of sales, a range of assets, a geographical area. So you fine tune it. When you first start, you might have 17,000 comparisons, and then you fine tune it to your particular company, you might have a couple hundred. Okay. Now you can really look and say, look at this. I'm in the top 100% on my current ratio, 15.4 for one. Now, if any of you know anything about accounting financial ratios or whatever, right? We'd say generally two to one's good. You have 15 to one, okay? Is that good? Not really, right? You gotta be careful. That's too darn good. What's that mean? They got too much cash sitting around doing nothing. Okay? Invest it, get it out, do something with it. Okay, they, it's showing that they're really strong, but there's another story here, right? That's why our asset efficiency ratios are so important. Because we have too much asset sitting around not being productive. Right? So this is a scorecard from the Twitter. This is a scorecard uh, for some asset efficiency, inventory, uh, current liabilities, the inventory, liabilities, net worth, quick ratios, and just sort of put it up. Sorry, go ahead. Now we have our asset efficiencies, our collection period. We're slow at collecting our receivables. Okay. We have a really poor inventory turnover, and we have an even worse asset to sales. Okay. So, Go one more page for me. Go one more page. Look at the profitability. Extremely profitable. Okay? So you can just look at these financial statements and think you have a great company, but when you dig in to the nuts and bolts of it, there's areas where we can work on improvement. Okay? Get that inventory under control, speed up our collection processes at normal ranges for our, our industry, and either invest for excess cash for growth, or pay it out to the owners or our shareholders and let them take it and, and do something else with it. That okay? shouldn't be sitting there. Uh, it, it's sitting there exposing yourself to potential loss if something goes wrong and you have a big litigation suit and you got a bunch of cash just sitting in the company that you don't need to cover with. You probably have about six million dollars in checking accounts. Crazy, right? Okay. But the point about benchmarking to start is it helps you identify where you're strong, where you're weak. Then you know what you need to work on. You go back to the PowerPoint now, please. And you can see you get a whole bunch of other data like sales per employee. You know, depending on your industry, if, if you're in the restaurant industry, you might get. Uh, Food costs for percent of sales, labor costs for percent of sales. You know, what, what might those things tell you? You know, if you have high food costs in relation to your sales, if the industry is 32 and you're at 38%, what might that tell you? Maybe, right? Too much waste, you're not aware about food spoiling going bad. Too much waste could have another problem. What might be the other problem? Yeah. We got we got to prep and cook, keep serving meals that people are sending back to the kitchen, going in the garbage can, right? Uh, more than likely, poor order, excess waste, stuff going in the dumpster, going bad before we get to use it, or bad and predicted sales, over order, expected higher sales than they actually achieve. Right? So, <clears throat> checklist, review financial reports, benchmark. Step one, I just give you, gave you a quick overview on that. Everyone comfortable with what I covered so far? Make sense? Okay. So then, uh, step two, analyze your cash flow. Look at challenges. Okay. Cash, you know, the old saying, cash is king, right? I don't care how profitable you are. And if you can't pay your bills, you're in trouble. Right? And managing cash for small businesses is probably the most difficult thing. That's what you've got to be on top of on a day-to-day -to -day type basis. You know? I mean, particularly if you're in growth situations. My firm is growing too fast, okay, and I can't keep up with the work to keep my clients happy. What do I have to do? I've got to hire on another staff person. Well, I might have the ability to pay $80,000 right off the bat, so how do I manage that cash? You know? and managing the cash is going to be extremely important for your long term success. Lots of small companies struggle with cash management, and they get into some bad habits factoring receivables, you know. Borrowing at mezzanine levels at high interest rates, uh, not taking discounts available on accounts payable, you know, 210 net 30 type deals. 
210 net 30, that's about 36% annual rate of return interest that you're paying by not taking advantage of that discount. So really got to analyze the cash flows and what the challenges there. Your end tax planning and strategy and the year maneuvers, we're going to get into some tax um, slides in, in a minute. Doesn't matter how much you make, it matters how much you get to keep, right? And uh, you got to always be looking after the, the, the tax side of the house. Uh, there's, there's lots of advantages or, or opportunities for small businesses to avail themselves of. We'll discuss a whole bunch of them that can really reduce your tax bill. But it does you no good. You know, the most frustrating thing for a CPA like myself is when I never hear from my client until it's tax season. And then they make an appointment when they come in March and they want to sit there and do some planning. I don't have time to do any planning right now. It does you no good. The year is in the rearview mirror. I can't change it. Anything that happened, happened. All I can do is report it. All I can do is make sure we're in compliance with, with the rules and regulations as we're filing the return. But there's very little we can do. Okay? And we don't have time for, for the planning. So you encourage that client to come back. You know? Around September, before we get to year end, let's do some forecasting, let's do some planning. Uh, and inevitably, you won't see them, you'll see them the next year in March or April again, and it's, it's the same scenario, and they're just spending excess money on taxes. So, tax planning should be part of your everyday business life. You get, to, get, get by the first half of the year, then start thinking about it. You've got plenty of time to make your maneuvers, okay? but don't ignore them. Set goals and strategize. The goal should be smart goals, right? Specific, measurable, attainable. Okay. Uh, if you don't have goals, you're really just floundering. You know, it's. I teach business at the executive level in, in, in graduate school. Okay. And it's amazing how many people don't really take goal setting as serious as, as they should. Yeah. In order to get the whole team moving in the same direction and achieving your goals, we have to know what those goals are. Okay? And you as the leader or as the sole proprietor, the owner of the organization should definitely know what your goals are. You know, what's your sales target? What what market uh, what percent of the market do you plan on capturing? How do you plan on doing that? What resources do you need to achieve it? Okay, it's not gonna happen just by sitting out there wishfully thinking. Okay. Create a budget. Okay. You cannot say goals and achieve them without budget. Yep. The budget is nothing more than your goals expressed in financial terms. That's my goals. That's what, that's what I want to have. Okay. How many of you go through the budget process at least once a year? Okay. Some, but not most. Okay. I, I would encourage you to do so. And not only business-wise, many, 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 many years ago, me and my wife, we were still in California. We had little ones. Uh, she was an executive. I was a partner in a large firm. You know, where did the kids go? And you get up at six in the morning, trying to race to get them to daycare. You don't work all day. You're watching the clock. Oh my gosh! If I don't get here in another two minutes, they're going to charge me ten dollars an hour because the kids are going to get out, right? You pick them up, you run out, have dinner, you know, get home, start the whole day over again. We, I think we did our first budget or plan after a couple years of marriage. And actually sat down and looked because we just put everything in a QuickBooks or what have you. I don't remember the number, but let's just say some crazy thing like twenty thousand dollars a year in, in meals out, restaurants, not groceries, meals out, right? And we started looking at things, and we said, you know, between the wardrobe to dress as an executive, which my wife was, between the meals out, between uh, the daycare, you know, yeah, she was making six figures, and we said. Not really. When the day is done, you're not, you're not doing anything. And my wife quit a job and stayed home and, and, and raised kids. And you know, that's what she wanted to do. Didn't, didn't, didn't feel it at all, but we budgeted and we planned and, and were able to accomplish that. If you're not budgeting or tracking your expenses, you have no idea how much money you're, you're wasting. We were talking earlier, things have gotten really expensive, right? Just clicks per clicks and, and how many automatic monthly charges do you have come out that you probably never even used and don't even know about. So, uh, Pace, take a look at all that stuff. Oh, there we go. Okay, let's talk a little about taxes. Um, this is probably one of the one of the most relevant new taxing 
set up for more closely held businesses that are operating as a pass-through entity if you're a high income individual. If you're a high income individual. Okay. Um, so this is the pass-through entity tax. Any of you familiar with what I'm talking about? Okay. So of course you do, you're a financial planner. <laughs> you're a Okay, so you know, if you file your taxes, it's become very difficult. Itemized deductions because the standard deduction has gotten so high. Number one. Number two, if you can itemize your deductions, you're probably making a whole lot of money. Okay? And you're giving a whole lot to charity and you have a, a whole lot in mortgage interest. Because Mary Fountain is doing over $25,000 of the standard deduction now, right? Okay. But high income individuals, I'm talking like that client I just showed you who's making a couple million dollars a year. You don't have to be that high, but if you're making a substantial amount of money, you can't take a deduction for your state income taxes in excess of $10,000 a year. It's called the SALT limit. So it's state and local tax limit. It was passed in 2017. Before that, you can deduct all your taxes in state. But Republicans were in control. You know, the only Democratic states in the face were that high taxation. And they said, we're not going to let your constituents deduct their state taxes anymore up to only $10,000. Okay. And it was politically motivated, but nonetheless, who did it hurt? Mostly just high income individuals, so who cares? Right? Well, states, almost every state now, has come up with a workaround. So if you operate as an LLC or an escort, which is a non taxable entity, okay, you pass your, your income to the shareholders or owners, and they pick it up on individual returns, okay, they don't pay you for taxes. But the states have passed these laws that say pass through any tax. I can elect to be a taxable entity for the state, even though I'm an S for the federal. And I can pay this pass through any tax at the entity level. Now I'm not limited to this $10,000 deduction. The entity gets to deduct the taxes and passes through the income after tax. So my K1 is lower and I pay less taxes. Okay, it's a beautiful workaround. And I, got a, I have a lot of doctor clients and high income individuals and I, I make this election on almost every pass-through entity return I do. Okay, it's only been in Georgia for two years now. <laughs> Para may be overlooking it. If you're doing your own taxes, most definitely you're overlooking it. Okay, it's something to, to think about. The ERC, it's dying. You probably hear that we have uh, three years of data filing. If you can't watch TV anymore without seeing a commercial for the ERC, okay, you probably got 100 emails in your inbox from a tax credit company that tells you, oh, you can get you know, $7,000 a quarter for your, every employee or $21,000 to this or that. Be very, very, very careful of third-party tax credit companies because they will make a claim that may not be a valid claim and you will get paid and they will take their third of it. And when you get audited and have to pay it back, it'll be long gone, and you'll be stuck holding the bag. Okay? Uh, and I've, this has happened in my 40 years of practice with every credit you can imagine. These people pop up, they're, they're around when these credits are here, they abuse the system, the IRS gets smart, shuts it down, the taxpayer gets stuck holding the bag. But this is a legitimate credit, and it's worth a lot of money if you're qualified. A whole lot of money. I have lots of clients that got hundreds of thousands of dollars legitimately. Okay. You have to have a substantial reduction in revenue, 20, 20 over 2019, 2021 over 2019, 70% for 2020, 50% for 2021, or you have to have a major COVID event and you shut down. That's, that's the kicker right there. We just got one of our clients, $248,000. Wow. There you go. Now, I, I hope you don't take any offense about me warning about third party tax credit no, I agree. I Reach that very same thing. Thank you. Uh, thank you. There are people who are legit. Don't take me wrong. I just said be careful. And those ones that are bombarding you with emails or, or commercials or what have you, I, I've seen it happen a lot. Uh, there was a darling tax credit company in Woodstock, Georgia, a few years ago that I have to know about that uh, didn't end so well because Georgia uh, went returned to someone's incredible prison. Okay, but you got to be careful with. With credits and use reputable people who've been around a long time. Okay? Credits are there for your benefit, but don't falsify credits and get money. Okay? That's no scale. You don't like that. Okay? So, ERC, you got three years from your original 
violence and 21 is still open, right? But, but 20 is gone and it's going to run out real soon. So if you had employees and you had even reductions or you had a COVID event, i.e. a government shutdown, you were in health care, they made you close a quarter or something like that, you may be eligible for up to $7,000 per employee credit, which you paid them. It could be a lot of money as, as we just heard 240000 one client. How big was that money? What, there were less than 18 employees. Less than 18 employees, $240,000. Okay. okay. 2023 year end planning. Strategy to implementation of 4731st. Estimate 23 liability now when I still have time to engage in some tax planning. Uh, I did this presentation at the end of 2022. I gave it a, a polish over uh, with the with, uh, short notice to come speak today. So we're a little early. Well, not really. We're, we're some kind of time frame. Now's a good time, actually. Now, now is time to start planning. Prepare baseline estimates, review the status of your employer pension plans, max out your contributions. Uh, if you're self employed and all you're using is an IRA and, and you want to save more money, you can do a whole lot better with some different type plans. Some SEPs or some uh, solo 401ks or various different plans, you can defer a whole lot more money than the $6,000. We got a couple of gentlemen in the room here who can uh, assist you with that, right? What, what do you do, actually? Uh, business consultant. Business help, consultant, okay. Help businesses reduce expenses. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, review nature of interest in dividends. Tax-free and qualified dividends versus ordinary tackle gain and loss harvesting. Okay. Um, we had a rocky road with the market in 2022, 2023. If you have a portfolio, you might have some losses. Okay. You might want to consider selling those losses before year end. Remember, you can only deduct up to three thousand dollars a year in losses. The rest you got to carry forward. But if you have some gains that you've recognized in other places, you want to recognize some gains and move out of some positions. Take a look at your losses, get rid of them, offset the gains, or get your three thousand dollar losses. Watch the wash sales rules. Okay, if you like that stock, you want to hold on to it, but you want to harvest your loss. Don't buy it back for at least 31 days. If you buy it back in 30 days or less, that loss will not be deductible. It's a wash sale, we'll just adjust the basis. If they went lost cars, uh, rental real estate, consider performing deferred maintenance, and losses possibly qualify for a real estate professional. Uh, uh, expand on that. Could you expand on that? I sure can. So most individuals, uh, rental property is what we call passive activity. <coughs> passive activities, can only, passive losses can only be used to offset passive income. So if you have a rental property that has a loss, you know what I mean, passive income, you got to carry that loss forward. You can't deduct it. Okay? If you're a real estate professional, that's a different story. You can deduct that. In order to qualify as a real estate professional, the, the regs have some safe harbors. One of them is you have to have at least 750 hours a year documented contemptuous records of working for your rental properties. Or you have to be a real estate professional. A licensed real estate agent uh, qualifies pretty easy, okay? Uh, but if you have a portfolio of rental properties and you do all your leasing, your advertising, your repairs, your maintenance, and you meet this threshold of 750 hours, you can take that loss regardless of it being a passive or about having income. Now, rental real estate has an exception to the overall passive all of the passive rules, passive income, offset, passive losses, losses can't exceed the, the income. Rental properties allow you $25,000 a year max as long as your just gross income is under 100 grand. If it's over 100,000, between 100 and 150, you lose $1 for every $2 it exceeds. So you phase out to zero at 150,000. So if you have 150,000 income, losses on rental, not deductible. Real estate professional, it is. Got it. Check required minimum distributions. Okay. Probably don't have to worry about that. I only see one or two people in the room that would worry about that. No, I don't. Probably none, actually. Now that we're up to 73. Uh, so uh, if you have pension plans or IRAs or what have you, you have to take a required minimum distribution. But we're, uh, we're all good here. We're going to talk about that. Uh, if you're not itemizing and you can't deduct your charitable contributions, but you still are a charitable-natured individual, there's some 
If some organizations, ministries you support, you want a gift, I bet you can surely just give them cash, write a check, they would love that. But if you happen to have appreciated assets, i.e. stocks and portfolios that are sitting on a bunch of gains that if you sell, you don't have to pay taxes on, and I want to give my charity $10,000, and I have stock worth $10,000 that I only paid $1,000 for, if I have a $9,000 gain, gift the stock. Okay? I don't have to recognize the gain and never pay income tax on it. The charitable organization gets the exact same contribution. Okay. Circle of Friends would absolutely love you for that too, so thank you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, fully fund your IRAs or other um, retirement plans uh, and explore benefits of Roth conversions. I can talk about that for longer than we have. Um, and so needs to keep me honest all the time because I can talk about this stuff in case you haven't noticed. Uh, I, I have a passion for it and I've, I've done it for a long time. So. <laughs> New rate of planning, strategies for implementation as we approach December 31st. Again, it's for the rough conversion. Self-employed business owners determine your optimal retirement plan. Uh, it may not be an IRA. It, it may be. That may be all you, you, you have excess ones is $6,000, $6,500. Um, but there, there are way better plans. Business, real estate investors, qualified business income. Uh, you may qualify your real estate as the qualified business income. Uh, qualified business income, again, relatively new, you get to deduct 20% of your qualified business income and arrive at your adjusted gross income from gross income, but it has to be qualified business income. Real estate may qualify, okay? If you happen to have two entities, you operate a company and, and you operate in a building that you own in another entity, you definitely qualify, okay? Uh, that real estate does qualify. If you don't have that situation, you have to have at least 250 hours a year in time in that real estate for it to be qualified business and it has to be documented, so you need to be careful of that. But it's a huge deduction, 20%. Uh, yes. They deduct 20% of the net income. Why can you deduct more of that? Because, it, well, it, it's a long history of, of how the qualified business income deduction came about, but it, it, was put in, was that 17? Uh, and it, it was to, in part of the Tax Reduction Act where businesses get taxed too much, okay, they come up with a net income, they take 20% off and of it as a qualified business income deduction, and then they have the net tax point. So, and real estate is not technically a business, so it didn't qualify unless you meet some of these exceptions. So this would be for any entity or LLC that matter? Yes. It does not matter. Pass through to the shareholders. That's what we're LLC. Disregarded. Consider hiring your children. And I put up if you're under 19. Regardless what under 19 or not. If you're a sole proprietor and you're under 19, my child's under 19, they work for me. I'm sole proprietor. I pay them wages. It's not subject to Social Security or Medicare. That's 7.65% in company match. There's no 7.65%, that's 15.3%, I just say. Right? By paying my child. Now, child standard deduction up to twelve thousand dollars thereabouts, it can be changed every year for, for inflation. Um, I can pay my child up to twelve thousand dollars and they pay zero. If I'm in a twenty two percent tax bracket, that's four thousand dollars that, that that's being saved by paying my child. My child is involved in sports, schools, anything, okay, that I pay for. I might as well give them some chores and pay them on the payroll you and then the take their money and they go, it's our friend, I don't care. <laughs> Fund your IRA. Well, let them have the money. And if you don't want to have them have the money, that's fine. I mean, I, every one of my kids have been on, on my payroll until they got, you know, out of the house and over the standard deduction amount. Now, listen, don't, don't, don't hire your toddler. Okay, wait till they're at least six years old. They could do something, right? But uh, <laughs> marketing content, right? There you go. Well, hey, some of you marketing people, yeah, hire, hire your kids for some photo shots. You know, post them on. Hey, uh, marketing. How much time do I have a week? About ten minutes. Okay, I need a time check. Thank you. Um, 
this is definitely, definitely worth considering if you have that budget. Fire your tour. Charitable strategies, again, to get over that threshold, maybe you bunch. Okay, so you do every two years. Yes, sir. Well, I already took the part. Maybe a W-2. Nope. LLC only. Can do it on an S-4. Yeah. Well, you can do it on an S-4. You just, you're just subject to Social Security tax. Oh, right. You can still do it. I mean, it's still going to be a big difference in tax rates. Sure. Probably everyone in this room is at 22% or above. Okay. So 22% and I can pay them $12,000 That's zero. 22% on 12 grand, you're going to save it. Now, you got to be careful if you're exceeding Social Security and Medicare. So if your income is above that 150, whatever the number is today, then you're no longer paying Social Security and Medicare. And if you pick it up here, that's 15.3, you know, it, it kind of eats at it. So you got to. Is there a, what is the match you pay if the child are 18 on salary for the. Reasonable compensation for services rendered. Yeah. <laughs> I can look at it. <laughs> Reasonable compensation for services rendered. Literally, that, that's the test. Okay, um, so you make sure that you document that they're providing services worth what you're paying them. Twelve thousand dollars a year. Twelve thousand dollars a year. You know, anyone gets fifteen dollars an hour nowadays. Do nothing. <laughs> right. Let's talk about that. That's another important point. You might not even be on my list because this is really important because I know this is a so you Yeah, well, we, we use our LLC for our kids. Okay. See that? Smart man here. Um, <laughs> S-Corps. Don't ever, 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 hear me again, ever, ever, ever have an s -corp. Take distributions and do not pay yourself a salary. Okay? That dog died in like 1986 okay, when the IRS finally got smart on this. So what happens is if you operate as an S-Corp, non-taxable entity, the corporation makes $100,000 a year, you get a K-1, you take the $100,000 over in your personal tax return. You pay income tax on it. On an S-Corp, unlike a partnership, unlike a sole proprietorship, unlike an LLC, you do not pay self-employment tax. Social Security Medicaid, 15.3%. So people who think they're smart say, oh, I'm going to get an escort. I'm not going to take any salary. I'm going to take only distribution. I'm only going to pay the tax. I don't care about Social Security or Medicaid. Anyhow, anyhow, it's going to be bankrupt by the time I get to collect it. Okay. The IRS does not like that game one bit. Okay. Automatic, almost automatic audits. Computers is very easy to detect. There's a line on an escort tax return. Office of salary, zero. On the K-1, there's a line distributions. $100,000. The IRS comes in and reclassifies your distribution as salary because you didn't get paid reasonable compensation for services rendered. Okay. Now they hit you with all the payroll taxes, penalties, and interest, and they triple what you would owe. There are still, I can't believe how many S Corp tax returns I've seen this year. Uh, I hired a, another staff accountant, uh, one of our uh, Mac students, a year ago, and she'd been out hustling business and growing the practice. I'm not growing my practice. I, I got work and I know what to do with it. Uh, and she's bringing in work, and I'm seeing all the desktop experts from other preparers that have distributions in their salaries. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, this, this has been, we did this, we did this in the 80s, okay? This has been closed down for a long time. It's really dangerous. If you have an desktop and you're doing that, you need to really think twice or talk to a professional because you're going to get in trouble. There is. It has to be reasonable compensation. I actually have a piece of software, uh, RC Reports, where it, it is a national database of wages by county, by every job you can think of that the IRS uses, and we, we, we do a profile on you. We do a compensation study. We sit down and, and say, because listen, if I can pay you only 100000 in salary and take 300 distributions, I'm happy to do it, but I'm not going to expose you. So yes, you have to have reasonable compensation for services rendered. The way to do that is to have documentation supporting that you're being paid reasonable compensation. Charitable strategies, bunch of alternative years to, to, to get over that itemized deduction threshold. You know, you might do that with your medical like your charities all together, you know, every other year type deal. And try to get over that standing deduction to get a little little better uh, break that year. Tax credits, deductions, 
solar panels for your house, alternative energy, but EV vehicles are, are, are still mid tax credits. Uh, college tuition related expense and American opportunity credit, lifetime learning credit. Okay, there's lots of educational credits, student loan interest deduction. Yes. Yeah, it, it's not as good as it used to be because you used to be able to deduct it for the for the federal as well. So if you want to support a private school in Georgia, okay, you have to enroll, and there's a limited amount of dollars that allow. So so you submit the paperwork, and if if any of kids go to private school, you probably get solicited for it. And let, let's say I'm going to give them five thousand dollars. Okay. So I make that gift through this Georgia fund, and I get to deduct that gift on my Georgia, I, I get a credit for that on my Georgia tax return, like it's state income tax payment. It's like withholding, but it's going to the school rather than to the state. It used to be the federal government would let me take it as a general contribution on top of that, but the IRS shut that down two years ago. So we can no longer do the charitable contribution on the federal, but it's dollar for dollar offset. If you decide you would rather have your tax dollars go to a private school than to the state, it's still very well in the school. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, that's I. If you should shop me a line, I'll look that up, but that doesn't sound right to me. And that sounds, uh, that sounds like that might run foul of the rules. You can't allocate it to yourself. Yes, you know, we had a, a, one of a, a non-profit school of mine that felt like this last week, actually. Yep. That uh, if we were unable to go to this fund, it's a deduction. Yes. So uh, as a business expense, and then also the tax credit. Not no more. It was a deduction until two years ago on the federal return. The federal had, had disallowed it. Okay. That's just the, just the state. It's, it's kind of the additional state of holding. Yeah. So it costs you nothing to do. Absolutely nothing. As long as you have enough state income tax. If you make a five thousand dollar contribution, you only have two thousand state income tax. So it's like it's a non refund So is it possible that you do some kind of planning and say, oh, I'm going to owe two thousand dollars in taxes? Uh, and you know what, I don't want to pay state taxes, I'm going to give $2,000 back to you. Without a doubt, what you've got to do is it's a lead time. You've got to do it early in the year, so yes, you do. And, and you plan it. My kids all went to King's Academy, and we, we did that for, for years as well. So it's a lead time. So let's say if I enroll a year to go, so if I want to constitute to a school, I need what, three months before they have the taxes? Uh, earlier. Yeah, it's, it's earlier in the year that they, they have the enrollment period. I don't know the specifics on the dates, but it's pretty early. So that's, that's pretty challenging to have that kind of level of tax information and budget in that early year. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I mean, it, 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 you always, you know, you, you just adjust your withholdings or your estimates. I mean, there's some level of taxes you probably pay pretty consistently. Right. So you can do that. All right, compliance. Hey, Tom, I'm sorry. Can I ask you a question? payments for all switch and other education uh, expenses? Yes. What if you're paying those on a 5 to 9 No. That's not the no. okay. okay. Okay, let's talk about a little compliance. This is where I see people get in trouble all the time. End of year. You paid 20 different people over $600 for services, and you did not collect the W-9 before you wrote them a check. And now it's time for you to issue 1099s. And in the last three to four years now, every single business tax return has two questions on it. Question number one, did you make any payments that would require any issuance of 1099s? Yes or no? Okay. If you cannot not answer it, the return will not be accepted on electric filing, electronic filing if you need the way. It will be rejected. So you must answer the question. Okay. <laughs> question number two. Did you issue 1099s for all those payments? Yes or no? Okay. So, if I paid people over six hundred dollars and didn't issue 1099s, and I answered the question, no, I did not pay anyone that required the issuance of 1099s. I just did a tax fraud, okay? And and that's that's big trouble, okay? Because I, I literally answered incorrectly. 
Uh, if I answer yes, and the next question says, do you wish you take all the required 10 day nights? And I answer no, good, I just created an order for myself. If I answer yes, and I didn't, I get committed tax fraud. Okay? And big, big penalties for that. Okay? Worse than, you know, not report being held and stuff like that. This, this is serious. Okay? This is Every, every business return, every S Corp, every uh, 1065, 1120 S, 1120, Schedule C, Schedule E, all of them have the questions on it. And they must be answered at 16 hours in the media business. That is correct, unless I'm a corporation, uh, and then it's not required. Okay? Uh, so, so, uh, we, so we get produce every week, $1,000. I don't need to, I mean, I'm not produce. That's correct. This is not service, this is products. It's services. See, oh. see if you hire a bronze man or me or. Yeah. Uh, what's your name? I'm sorry. Kevin. Kevin, you know, more than likely, depending on, on the type of entity, you're talking 10 million dollars. If you're in the construction industry, you got them all over the place. And, you know, we don't want to get into the fact that half of your subcontractors are really employees. Common law, uh, that, that's a whole different, you know, one on one conversation. But. The problem is, now I'm year in, I need to issue 1099s, I got a deadline in my face in January 31, and I call you up and I say, hey, I need a W-9, I need a social security number. And you know, no one wants to return that phone call because they know exactly why. Okay, so you're stuck. So before you write anyone a check that's going to be required to 1099, you get the W-9 before they get the check. Okay. Yeah, I got a check for you, by the office, and you need to sign a W-9. Well, let me see your driver's license while you're at it. Okay, um, you don't need to do a 99, but but be careful of that. Problem one. Problem two, S corporations. A couple of them in here. You have employee benefits, which include medical insurance. Medical insurance for a more than three percent owner of an S Corp is not deductible on the S Corp unless unless you add it to the W two. It's a taxable fringe benefit, okay? Not subject to Social Security and Medicare tax, so it does not cost you Social Security and Medicare tax, but subject to a full. You must add an NTW2 on the last paycheck of the year if you don't do it throughout the year, okay? And then you get to deduct 100% of it on your individual tax return as self-employed medical insurance deduction. But if you do not do that, it's not deductible. 90% of the yes calls don't do it, okay? It's only if you're more than 3% order, okay? You get ordered, it's going to be disallowed. So make sure you run your medical insurance through your payroll. Holiday gifts and bonuses, etc. There's no such thing as a gift to an employee. IRS is pretty, pretty, pretty serious about that. Anything you give an employee's compensation belongs on W-2. Okay? You can get very union of this gifts. You want to know what the rev, what, what the limit is? Anyone got a guess? Twenty-five. Still twenty-five bucks since I can't even give something. You need to give it your time, right? I had a client get ordered a really large client in California, fifty million dollar year company. Got ordered. The only thing the IRS agent wanted to make an adjustment was for for holiday honey baked hands. When they bought a couple hundred of them, gave them to the customers and vendors, and they cost about sixty bucks. And I know it was fourteen thousand dollar adjustment the IRS agent was proposed. And I said, "Those fifty million agent." I said, "Really?" I said, "Okay, let me tell you something. You sold a forty million dollar year close to home company where we could be cheaping you out hundreds of thousand dollars a year. You didn't know it." You're going to insult this guy with gifts that he gave to customers and makes his business successful and charge him twelve thousand dollars. We'll get it back for the time over. We do And he decided to pass on that adjustment. But uh, don't don't do it. So, Kimmy, it, it, the alternative is that you do employee enrichment parties or employee enrichment activities that go in lieu of cash allowance. You 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 can do holiday parties most definitely, and and they are are deductible. Uh, but you can't say, hey, you can go have your holiday party and take your wife out or work, something like that. If you do that, it's really a bonus and it's taxable. So you got you to be, be careful. Yeah. So this is the uh, rule change about uh, deduction of the fee. Is that what you're saying? Yes, 100%. Uh, 2023, it's restaurant. And rather than 50%, so you're trying to get the restaurants back up all right in pre COVID. And today, it's no longer deductible, period. Only food. Take a client from the Braves game, nothing about it. But the food at the game. That's correct. That's correct. The question on that. Yes. What if, what if um, it's possible to have a employee take for themselves and be the first employee? No. Depending on 
themselves for what? Let's say an employee goes to various bank and they work for themselves. And then the business reimbursement can for that expense. No. It's not, it's, not a, it's not an ordinary necessary business and deduction. I mean, you can't deduct that. Absolutely not. Okay, I, I think I'm out of time. I, I'm getting the, 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 the job. I knew I had more material than I can cover. Um, and we still have 10 minutes so few questions, right? So, I got this slide, uh, some very common popular deductions that you might want to consider. You know, have some very common credits that you may qualify for. Uh, yeah, take a, take a shot on that if you like. And uh, the lifetime line of credit is uh, after you've uh, used up your American Opportunity Credit, which is only the first four years of your life, uh, which is the best education credit there is. Lifetime line of credit, if I go take a class, I can get you know, over 20% deduction. It's you get out of the way. Hey, Stump, can you step to the side for a he moves around a lot. Of Sorry, I move around a lot when I teach. Yes, yes. I'm the professor in him. <laughs> so, so. Um, I had a whole other session, a whole other section on budgeting, but I tell you what, you guys uh, are all self-employed. You seem to have some questions. I'll, I'll open it up and, and let you fire at me and, and see if I can answer them. I don't know that. No, not yet. <laughs> Child support. Uh, no. Child support did I like look yeah. no. uh, if, if, um, uh, if the mother is amenable, I can hire my son and pay that as child support. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I like that. I like that. That is a genius. You know what? No one's ever done that. That might work. Uh, it might, right? It might work. Just don't piss her off. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I have one other question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From a moral standpoint. Always you know, stay in lane, mind your own business, but then if we never had whistleblowers, nothing would have achieved. So if you are aware of somebody who is uh, exorbitantly not paying your taxes, would you turn them? Oh boy, oh boy, that's that's a tough question. Um, probably not. There, there is there is a moral. So I, I will tell you this. I have prided myself. I, I don't, I'm ending my career, right? I've practiced for four years. In one location. I've never had a complaint. I've had a peer review practice for 40 years. I never encouraged a client to cheat. I've always encouraged them to be as aggressive as we could legally, playing within the boundaries, and I never do work for what I know is cheaters. I've been told by clients you will do this, and I'll say, no, I will not. You will find someone else to do this because you can't pay me enough to lose my license and my integrity. Um, do I just want to rat someone out and get them in trouble? I, I probably would. I, I, you know, that's, like, that's, that's real individual, right? Tom, great presentation. I appreciate everything. I, I'm going to uh, pull in my friend Mike here. Uh, I'm, I'm in an interesting situation. Mike's not my advisor, but how do you suggest collaborating with a financial advisor, a tax advisor, and a legal advisor, all in the same appropriate manner to make sure that we're covered legally and we are maximizing what our tax, whatever adjective you want to say about tax. Awesome, awesome, awesome question. Really, really high level question. Uh, how do I recommend that? What is is find all three of those individuals. They're all very, very, very important. And they all have a different specialty. Find three of them in an ideal situation that work together and have have a good reputation. Get referrals from people. That's 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 the best way. I, I don't you know I put up a website again a year ago just because I got you know, people in the office and I have to have a website, right? I don't have to have a website. You know, you really don't. Um, find people that have good reputation in the community that are recommended and and work with them. So the old stats, and it's not real fresh in my mind, but something like 90% of all small businesses fail within the first three to five years of operation. And the two common, most common reasons for those failures is one is undercapitalization, two is lack of professional advice. The most important professional advice you could have in small business is an attorney, CPA, and a good financial planner for a long, long range of financial health. Okay? Um, some CPAs be do both, okay? But most of them aren't going to matter for management. Real old law, the AICPA, used to prohibit CPAs from having contingent fees. We weren't allowed to. Okay. So although we have a lot of financial knowledge, 
it, it, it reached our independence, supposedly, if we're selling a product or a recommended product, right? So, so the AICDA, the American Institute of Sort of Public Accountants, just allowed it. American Express started buying CPA firms to launch their financial planning practice and sell insurance products and challenged the CPA one foot that it was unfair restraint of trade. So a lot of CPAs sell products now. Um, I, you talk moral, I guess I'm an old school licensed guy and I, I don't view that. I, I, don't, I don't think he's right. You know, I, I work with people like Mike and say, okay, here's a client. I'll work with that financial planner and, and I'll lay out my strategy. I'll find them just as much tooth and nail because a lot of times I'm as knowledgeable as they are. Okay, but we'll work as a team. And I think clients that serve that way. Awesome. Uh, I'll follow up. Uh, I don't know. Paige is still in here, but uh, I'll, I'll ask a selfish question in terms of charitable uh, charities. Are are let's say you as as the Bayview Associates uh, out of your heart want to support. Limitless disabilities. Uh, if you are sponsoring an event versus doing a charitable contribution as a business, is that looked at taxably the same, or is one a business, one a business and marketing expense and one a charitable expense? And does the IR, IRS can constitute that the same taxably? No. Um, it, it, if I just flat out write a check to live with those disabilities, okay, uh, it's obviously a contribution, okay. Um, now, depending on my type of entity, if I was one of these past two entities, charitable contribution is not deductible on an S one, okay. It's going to come through the K one pass through. I'm going to pick it up on my individual tax return, schedule A itemized deductions. If I can't itemize, I don't get a deduction. Okay. If I sponsor an event for the benefits, we do this a lot at the Innovations Fund. Uh, we support Must Ministries quite frequently. We did a, we did a thing on our parking lot, acts of kindness. We had the Astro and Van come, and we paid for everything, the, the van and the food and whatever, invited the community, and we just asked the community to make donations to Must. I wrote that off of the advertising market, okay. <laughs> which legitimately I think it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so, so yeah, they are, they are different. I got a message from someone who's watching this. He wants to know if you knew anything about the new BOI rule. Um, and it just, just passed like this month, so it's possible you don't know it. Uh, it's the uh, beneficial ownership information thing. If you own 25% of an LLC, that's great, it's something you have to do or file correctly, otherwise you're going to do it straight. Do you know anything about that? I absolutely do not. Okay. So, sorry, I can't help you. Okay. If, if, if you want to follow up, you can get your answer, but. If you're talking the last month, I know nothing. I did not know to the grade, so I also know nothing. <laughs> That's cool. Someone's watching live and wanted to ask a question. Yep. Do you have one more? Uh, if, just an endorsement for Tom. If you guys have an innovation spot, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, I've been there. Your wife is great, and it's a great spot. Check it out. Appreciate it. Thank you. Another great resource in our community. Any other? Anybody else with a lasting question? <laughs>
talk to you about all things resources for small businesses, and they have a plethora of resources, so great one. So put that on your calendar, we'll share it in advance, and then please share it with others. Looking forward to meeting him. Um, please connect with us. Uh, we do um, have we do post this on social media and our um, our those outlets, and we have you in our database. But we would love for you to stay connected to us, um, whether it's for you or someone in the community that you know that you come across that you think can benefit from our services. Again, more up to date. Um, I mentioned co-ed at the top of our meeting. We're very complex and very unique. And the way we go about supporting the ecosystem here, not only in Cherokee County, but to me, the county, the state, and the region. And we have that through our retention and our recruitment and our film and our workforce development and our entrepreneurial arm. We are a very complex organization with one mission in mind, and that is to build the ecosystem here and to support you as a small business and our business community. So know that we, we have your back, and we're always looking for ways to improve or perfect or bring our resources to you. And one of those is our Cherokee Career Expo that's coming up on September 27th. Um, many of you are own your own business, so you may not be looking for work, but you may be, um, have people that are looking for work. So this is a great opportunity to come and meet employers in our community. It's going to be at Northside Hospital Cherokee Conference Room on the 27th from 2 to 6. Um, would love to have as many people there um, looking for employment. We're going to have lots of employers there set up that are looking to hire now. And again, uh, we did away with our sign-in sheet. And so um, if you have not had an opportunity to scan the, the barcode, please do so that we can connect with you. And then when you get tired of us, you can always unsubscribe. Any last minute comments or thoughts before we wrap up? Anything from the co-ed team? Film or? I don't know. They just turned, they turned me off five minutes ago. They're all, they're all over there working, working, working. All right, guys. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.